I want to begin by asking you to imagine the next 28 days of your life. And for each of these 28 days, I want you to predict how often you will think about sex. Here's what we might see for most men. A fairly high and stable level of sexual <laughs> thoughts. And here's what we might see for women. A different pattern. Now, it might not surprise you that men think about sex more than women do, but what you might be noticing is something that happens towards the middle of these 28 days, and women begin to think about sex just as much as men do. Well, rather than being the next 28 days of your life, what this graph actually represents is a woman's ovulatory cycle, which spans on average 28 days. And this pink line that's tracking women's sexual thoughts actually maps on to fluctuations in the ovarian hormone estrogen across the cycle. Estrogen peaks right before women ovulate. And ovulation happens on about day 14 of a 28-day cycle. This is when women release a single sex cell known as an ovum or an egg. And this is the only time for women that sex can result in a pregnancy. So it's no surprise or coincidence that women think about sex a little bit more leading up to this point in time. Well, what about men? Do they have a 28-day cycle in which they produce a single sex cell? No. Men are constantly producing millions of sperm cells, and they always carry with them the possibility that sex can result in reproduction, therefore that they maintain that fairly high and stable level of sexual thoughts. Because women can only reproduce when they ovulate, it follows that at this time, women's motivation should shift, not just to optimize choice of a sexual partner, but also to optimize competition with other women for access to the best men in town. And that's what I'm gonna to talk to you about today, estrogen's effects on women's courtship and competition, and I'm gonna start with the courtship. So as estrogen levels increase and women approach ovulation, they're interested in a different kind of man. Now, although women always want a man who's gonna be faithful and honest, gonna make a good father, gonna be a good partner, the prototypical good dad, they experience an increase in sexual desire, specifically for men who are masculine, charismatic, socially dominant, and strikingly attractive. The prototypical bad boy. Why? Well, <laughs> it's thought that men who have these traits, masculinity and social dominance, have higher genetic fitness. So a woman who has an increase in sexual desire specifically for these men at ovulation would pass those genes onto her offspring and her offspring themselves would have fared better. And this was particularly important across the thousands of years of human history where we did not have access to modern medicine and we still carry those preferences with us. In fact, when we run studies in the lab where we have women in evaluating different kinds of men, we not only see that their sexual desire for these bad boy type of guys increases at ovulation, but they start flirting with them more. So we'll see women, when they're talking to these bad boys, do things like this. Oh, you like basketball? Me too. I actually also really like basketball. I just joined the intramural team, hair flip, followed by a head tilt. <laughs> so... We see a lot of verbal and nonverbal flirting increasing specifically with these kind of guys. So because women have this natural preference at ovulation for these bad boys type of guys, the guys who don't normally have a great track record in long-term relationships, it makes it the perfect time to study what I call the bad boy effect. The idea that women say they want a nice guy, yet nevertheless continue to pursue and often, often heartbroken by men who are not so nice, myself included. So, how do women reconcile this ovulatory increase in desire for these bad boys with a conscious desire for a nice guy? Well, turns out women deceive themselves and they come to see these bad boys as better potential partners than they're actually likely to be. In one study, we set it up so women would come into the lab and actually have a conversation with a guy who was a bad boy. Uh, he actually was an actor portraying a bad boy, so this is a man who's very charismatic and socially dominant. And women came in, they had a conversation with this man, he was an actor, they thought he was actually a student with them at the university. And after they got done having their conversation, we asked the women, now imagine that you and this man have a child together. How much do you think he will contribute to the care of that child? And what we found was this. 
When women were not ovulating and estrogen levels were relatively low, they estimated that he would contribute about 41% to the care of a child in the form of feeding, giving the baby baths, changing diapers, knowing that she would fill in the remaining 59%. When these same women were ovulating, they were, estrogen levels were relatively high, something changed. And they said, oh, this guy, oh, over half. Oh, of course, he will be caring for my child. A 10% increase in their perceptions of how good of a dad this guy was going to be. So what is happening here is that women are deceiving themselves, coming to see these men as better potential future fathers. It's that extra push women need to be receptive to these men at ovulation. But there exists one critical barrier when it comes to attracting these men, and that's all the other women in the local environment who also desire them. So all the flirting and the increase in sexual desire and seeing the bad boys magically transform into a good dad is only effective and it only has that payoff if women have not first ensured that they are as attractive, if not more attractive, than all the other women in their neighborhood, in their local environment. So ovulation shouldn't just influence women's courtship motivations. It should also amp up their desire to compete with other women for status and access to mates. And I've coined this idea the ovulatory competition hypothesis. Competing more at ovulation is something that we see in other species, including non-human primates. So I want you to imagine for a moment a monkey version of the reality TV show The Bachelor, where there is one bachelor and a number of women who are competing for his attention. Well, that's exactly the setup at Yerkes National Primate Center in Atlanta, Georgia, where there are few males and a number of females. So this is one group of monkeys at Yerkes, and in this group there is one male, there he is, and uh, the rest of the monkeys are females. And what we see is that although the females remain relatively neutral towards one another on most days, this changes as estrogen levels increase and these female monkeys approach ovulation, they become much more aggressive and competitive with each other, using threatening gestures and sometimes even physically attacking other females in their group who they're competing with for male attention. So what about women? Well, women rarely physically attack one another, at least outside of reality TV. But that doesn't mean that women don't compete in other more subtle ways. And one of the ways that women compete with each other is through their choice of dress. And what we find is, is that near ovulation, women want to look more fashionable and dress sexier. In one study, we had women come into the lab and we gave them a canister of colored pencils and a paper doll. And we said, imagine that you're going to a party at a friend's house tonight. From what this friend tells you, there are going to be a lot of single and attractive people. Start thinking about what you're going to wear. And when you have an idea, draw on the paper doll the outfit that you want to wear to, wear to the party. And to give you an idea of what we found, this is one woman's drawing of the outfit that she wanted to wear to the party on a day that she was not ovulating, so estrogen levels were relatively low. And this is the same woman's drawing of the outfit that she wanted to wear on a day in which she was ovulating. So we can look and see a shift, right? So she's going from something fashionable, but a little conservative, and then amping it up and getting sexier. So this is a shift we see across women within the range of what the woman would normally wear. Now you might be looking at this ovulating outfit here and say, well that is an outfit that's meant to directly impress a man. But remember that barrier, that hurdle. This is only effective if women have not first ensured that they're as attractive or as sexy as all the other women. What are, what are all the other women wearing? Well, how do they look? When we manipulate the bar and we lower it, and we lead women to think that they are more attractive than all the other women in the neighborhood or in the room, what happens is we no longer see this effect. They stop dressing sexy. So what they're doing is saying, you know what, I got this in the bag. But when we raise the bar and we lead women to think that they are less attractive than all the other women in the room, this effect is exacerbated even more and women want even more sexier outfits. Women derogate each other more in ovulation too and they become more materialistic and they're particularly concerned with what kind of products they have compared to other women. They want better houses and jewelry than what other women are having. And so what's happening here is that women are looking to position themselves ahead of rivals kind of given the Heisman, uh, for status and access to mates, much in the same way the female monkeys were. 
So I want to point out here that the behavioral effects I've outlined are those that we've documented in heterosexual women. But lesbian women still ovulate and they still have the same fluctuations in hormones across the cycle. Therefore, the behavioral effects would likely still be present in lesbian women, only the sexual desire, the sexual thoughts would be towards different targets. But women on hormonal birth control do not ovulate. And therefore, the effects that I've outlined today would be absent in these women. So what's the big picture here? Documenting shifts in women's behavior at ovulation can have important implications for our understanding of how mating goals in general, both courtship and competition, can influence an array of behaviors in women, from how, why, and when we share word of mouth to how we negotiate in the workplace, to why we buy so many high heel shoes and handbags that men really could care less about. And it can even provide an answer to the paradox of women's taste in men. Why do we love bad boys? Well, turns out we wear a pair of nature's aptly designed rose-colored glasses that magically transform Mr. Bad Boy into Mr. Good Dad, leading us to believe, for me, he may change. <laughs> it's estrogen's way of telling us to swing for the fences because you never know. You could be the one to turn Mr. Wrong into Mr. Right. Thank you.